the long peace and blessings. Welcome to the Fourth Energy Center. Uh, and I am Jadiel uh, here again. Today we're going to be discussing a very deep topic. Um, it's a very, I would say, of course, it's very important. All topics in the scriptures is very important, but this one is important because I'm starting to see that there's a, a habit or that there's a trend with uh, the misinterpretation of this particular understanding is starting to snowball, meaning that it's starting to become bigger, it's starting to connect with other ideas, it's starting to paint a different picture than what the scripture is actually painting. Today, we're going to be discussing the second coming. And we're going to be discussing the nature of it, like how it's going to happen, what's going to happen, how what's going to happen to the earth, the people. It's We're going to be discussing all those things today. So it may get pretty lengthy. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it short. Uh, we are going to break it up, uh, but we're going to be discussing this in order to lead up to our next study, which is the millennium and then the what is the second death. So that way we can get a clear view of the whole sequence of events. OK, so. Uh, with that being said, I want to start with understanding that there's a difference between uh, the wrath of the Father and the wrath of the Lamb. There's two different demonstrations. One is demonstrated different than the other. One is referred to as the wrath of the Father. One is the referred to as the wrath of Lamb. So let's let's look at that first before we get into the second coming. It definitely connects and it ties in. It has something that it the wrath of the lamb definitely has something to do with the second coming. So let's start with the wrath of the father, the wrath of Elohim. All right. In the book of Revelation, it talks about the wrath of Elohim, and it also describes it as um, a wine press. Look at verse 10. It says, uh, this is talking about the, day, the mark of the beast, those who take the mark of the beast, right? Give me one second. Let me see if I could. All right. All right. Verse nine, it says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of Elohim, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. So it says, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of Elohim. Let's, let's look at another description of it. I'm going to look at quite a few real quick, just so we can get the full context of what this is. Verse 19 says, and an angel thrust in the sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press, the great wine press of the wrath of Elohim. And the wine press was trodden without the city, and a blood came out of the wine press, even unto the horse bridle, uh, by the space of a thousand and three hundred furlongs. Now, this is Hebrew language because it says trodden outside without the city, meaning. Uh, it said curses everyone who is is punished. When you look through the Torah, the one of the main ways that the punishment had to take place outside of the city of Jerusalem or outside from the presence of Yah's peoples uh, of the city or the dwelling place of Yah's people. So this is very important for us to understand that the wine press is a separation between the people who are a part of the group referred to as Mount Zion or Yah's people. And then the wicked is put outside of the city in order to obtain their punishment. So remember that the wrath of Elohim, the wine press. Let's go to chapter 15, verse one. And it says, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having seven last plagues, seven last plagues, because in them is filled up the wrath of Elohim. So the wrath of Elohim is going to be within these seven uh, these seven last plagues, which is going to be manifested by these seven angels. Let's continue to look a little bit a little bit deeper. Let's go to verse seven. Um, so he says, one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of Elohim, 
who lives forever and ever. So again, the seven angels that's going to dis, you know, disperse this, this seven last plagues is symbolized here by the golden vials. So the golden vials possesses in it the full wrath of Elohim, which he's going to pour out on the earth by these seven angels. Uh, let's go to chapter 16, verse 1. It says, and I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, right? The seven angels, go your way, pour out the vials of the wrath of Elohim upon the earth. Go your way. And what does it say? Go your way and pour out the vials of the wrath of Elohim upon the earth. So the earth, before the, the second coming occurs, there's going to be the wrath of Elohim poured out on the earth prior, before the second coming this is what's called the seven the seven last plagues is also referred to as the wrath of elohim without mixture let's look at verse 19 of this chapter it says the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and the great babylon came in remembrance before elohim and it says to give her unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath the fierceness of his wrath so this is very important for us to see that the wrath of Elohim pours out on Babylon, on the nations, on the earth prior to the Messiah coming back. This is not after a thousand years. This is not after the millennium. This is before the thousand years. The thousand years commences when the first resurrection or the first um, or the second coming of Messiah occurs. And we're going to look at the nature of that. Just wanted to show a difference between the wrath of the wrath of Yah's the seven last plagues being poured out on the earth before the second coming. So what is the wrath of the Lamb? Let's look at it. Let's go to Revelation chapter six, looking at verse 16. And it says, And he said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us. Let's let's look at it a little, a little bit higher. Let's go to let me see if we could go to. Now, those of you who are studying the seven seals, this is definitely a part of the six seals. And look at what it says in verse 14. It says, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. Every mountain and island was moved out of their places. The kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every freeman, they hid themselves in dens and in rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains, rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand what is it talking about the great day the seven last plagues have been poured pouring out onto the earth so what is this particular event it is the coming of the the messiah it is the face of the wrath of the lamb the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb the second coming is to bring the wrath of the Lamb. So let's look at a few statements in the Gospels specifically. Let's go to Matthew chapter 16, looking at verse 27. It says, The Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and he shall reward every man according to his works. According to his works. So the Son of Man is going to come in his glory. He's going to reward every man according to his works. That means that his wrath is going to be upon the wicked and good is going to be upon the righteous. So every man is going to receive something according to their works, including both righteous and wicked will receive something at that time. We saw the the, the what the wicked will be saying. They'll be running into dens, running away, hiding, saying for the rocks to fall on them to hide them from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. Let's continue to look at a few more verses. Let's go to the book of Mark. The book of Mark, verse 18, verse 38. And it says, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the son of man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father and with his angels. There's a constant reference to the description of how he's going to come. He's going to come in the glory of his father, like the power and the majesty of the father is going to be upon him. 
Why? Because in John chapter 5, verse 22, he says the father doesn't bring any judgment, but he commits all judgment to the son. John chapter 5, verse 22. So it's very clear why he's going to come in the majesty, in the power, in the glory, in the righteousness of his father when he comes to this earth with his holy angels. Let's go look at the book of Luke. The book of Luke, we have quite a bit of verses to cover, but I want to make sure that we cover these points so that way we can get a picture in our head. Luke chapter 9, looking at verse 26. It says, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and, uh, and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed. When he comes, and look what it says. When he comes in his own glory and in his Father's glory, and of the holy angels he's going to come in his own majesty and the majesty that his father gave him plus his his father's authority plus the holy angels is going to be with him <clears throat> so how is this going to be just to tackle the second coming is this going to be like some type of secret rapture or something is going to be people are going to be taken without anybody seeing well let's look at revelation chapter 1 verse 7 makes it very clear he says because behold he comes with the clouds and every eye every eye shall see him every eye both righteous and wicked every eye shall see him and they that also that pierced him and look what else all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him even so Amen. This is exactly what we read earlier uh, when we looked at Revelation 6, 16, where it talked about all the people running away from the coming of the wrath of the Lamb, of the coming of the Lamb. This is what it's talking about, where it says, all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, because of his presence. He's coming in the glory, his majesty, and he's coming in the glory of his father. What does that, What is that going to do to every eye? There's the righteous that's going to see him and there's the wicked that's going to see him. What is it going to do to the righteous and what is it going to do to the wicked? We're going to see this in a second. So the first thing that I wanted to kind of solidify real quick is that the wrath of the father is the seven last plagues that's poured out on this earth because of the wickedness, especially the wickedness that's done because of the persecution that's going to be taking place against Yah's people. The wrath of the lamb is when the coming of Messiah is here and he is coming in the glory of his father. And then there's this response. He, he's coming to reward them according to their work. So there's something that is going to happen to the wicked and the righteous um, at the coming in full majesty and full glory. So uh, with that being said, let's, let's look at what it says about the righteous real quick. And then we're going to see what's going to happen with the wicked. Okay. So the first thing we're going to see, let me see if I can pull it up real quick. We're going to go to 1 John. We're going to go to 1 John chapter 3. We've got a lot of prophets that we're going to see what they say about this too. Uh, John, 1 John chapter 3 verse 2, it says, Beloved, now are we the sons of Elohim, and it does not yet appear what we shall be so this is talking about how are we gonna how what are we gonna be we're the sons of elohim what are we gonna be it says but we know that when he shall appear the second coming of messiah we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is so look at the correlation it's saying that you're gonna be like him and the reason why you're going to be like him is because you can see him. So you see, seeing him, there has to be something that occurs or changes or we must appear as something, right? It says we do, we do not know what we shall be, but we're going to, we're going to, something is going to happen to us where we are able to see this majesty and this glory. Let's look at, uh, let's look at what is going to happen to us in first Corinthians uh, chapter 15 and then we're going to go to the book of isaiah real quick first corinthians i'm still debating if we should go to the book uh first corinthians or just continue to dissect this uh first corinthians looking at verse uh chapter 15 15 looking at verse 49 it says 
we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So this is what we're going to be. We don't know what that means in a fullest extent, but we know that we shall be like the Messiah. Whatever the Messiah is like, we shall be like the Messiah. But how will we be like the Messiah? Verse 50. It says, now I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of Elohim, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. But behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Something is going to happen where we're going to be changed. And then it says, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. And we're going to talk about that last trump in a second. In the moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we're gonna we're gonna tackle this because many people use this verse in order to express that people will be taken in a twinkling of an eye in the rapture doctrine. This is never referring to you being taken, but simply you being changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. What is happening? The Messiah is coming to give people according to their works. One of the things that he's going to give according to their works is immortality. Let's take a look at that. Let's let Messiah say it in his own words. John chapter 5. We are going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump into immortals those who are dead were raised immortal or incorrupted so that way we'll be able to see the glory of the father the, on the messiah when he comes let's look at this john chapter 5 looking at verse 20 22 to 29 it says very clearly for the father judges no man but commits all judgment unto the son that all men should honor the son, even as the, as they honor the father. He that honors not the son honors not the father which sent him. Verily, verily, I say to you, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me, which is talking about the father, has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. Verily, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the son of Elohim and they that hear shall live this is the same thing that we just referred to at the second coming those who are alive will be changed into immortal those who are dead will be raised immortal verse 26 for as the father has life in himself so has he given the son to have life in himself this is talking about immortality and have given him authority right authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man so he has the authority to to reward the wicked and the righteous. He has the authority to reward the righteous with immortality. But there's also something he's going to give to the wicked as well at that same time. Marvel not at this for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice some, and, sh and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, immortality, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So this is talking about um, a, res a specific resurrection that's going to occur for the wicked. And that resurrection will not occur when he comes. There, there is no resurrection when he comes. There's going to be a resurrection, which we're going to talk about in another video right after this, um, about the what's going to occur after the millennium uh, in Revelation chapter 20. So we see here clearly that when he comes, there's going to be a resurrection and there's going to be a giving of immortality to the righteous. Okay? This judgment is given to him right here, verse 27. And have given him authority and execute judgment also because he is the son of man. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It talks about this second coming and it talks about only talking about the interaction between him and the righteous. Let's look at this. It says, for the master himself shall descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel. And it says here, with the trumpet of Elohim. This is exactly what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says, with the trumpet of Elohim and the dead in Messiah shall rise first. The dead in Messiah shall rise first. So this is, means 
that the dead in Messiah or the righteous dead will rise first, meaning like this portion of time, the righteous will rise and the wicked will not rise at this time. Then we which are alive, those righteous people who saw his coming, will remain and shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the master in the air. So shall we ever be with the master. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So you have two end of, two two sets of people, the righteous that are dead and the righteous that are alive. Uh, according to 1 Corinthians 15, they shall be changed in a twinkling of an eye at the last trump at this moment of time. They're going to be able to see him come in the glory of his father, see him come in, the, in his own glory and see him come with all the angels. They're going to be able to withstand and see these things. Let's go to one more. Uh, let's go to another verse. And then it's going to start getting into the to how everything else is going to re react to his coming. You see, the righteous is receiving a reward. Everything is all good. It seems like everything is smooth. But we're going to see what's actually occurring on this earth um, when Messiah comes. First, uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 6 to 10. Look at what it says. It is a righteous thing with Elohim to, to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, right? To give trouble to those who trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the master Yahushua shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And look what it says. In the flaming fire, taking vengeance on them. What is he doing to the, to the we just saw. He's giving the righteous immortality. Look at what he's giving to the wicked who persecute the righteous. He's coming back in a flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not Elohim. This is the wrath of the lamb. It says, and that obey not the gospel of our master, Yahushua Messiah. It says, who shall be punished with the everlasting destruction from the presence, the presence of the master and from the glory of his power. When he shall come, right? When he shall come, this is talking about his second coming. This is what's going to happen to the wicked when he comes. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints or holy ones and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Look at, look at this. He's coming, taking vengeance. When you take vengeance, that means that you're giving something in response, uh, you're you're giving a reward for wickedness. I'm taking vengeance on them that do not know Elohim. Um, so this is very interesting that it makes this plain statement in Second Thessalonians. It says to you who are troubled. Um, it says, seeing it is a righteous thing. Now we have to understand this. We have to understand this. It is a righteous thing with Elohim to repay tribulation to them that trouble you. So all of the trouble that we're talking about, about the last days, all of the distress, all of the oppression, when Messiah comes, this is why in Revelation 6, 16, you saw that the wicked people were running away, telling the rocks to fall on them because they're receiving the wrath of the land. When he comes, he's going to repay. Um, let's see what that looks like. Let's see what the earth looks like in that, in that regard. Second Peter chapter 3. We're going to look at verse, we're going to look at quite a few verses here. This is talking about the mindset of the wicked. This is talking about the nature of how it, things are going to be when he comes. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by the way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. And we're going to look at what the prophets say um, in a second. Uh, and the commandment of us, the apostles of the master and savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. So now he's talking about the last days, which is referred to as the last days because it's right before the Messiah comes. When Messiah comes is the beginning of eternity. But this is talking about the last days on earth before the Messiah comes. So in the last days, there shall be scoffers walking in their own lusts. And saying, meaning in their mind, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers have fallen asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. 
This they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of Elohim in the heavens of old, the earth standing out of water and in water, whereby the world was then was being overflowed with water, perished. Talking about the flood, the judgment that came. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, right, which are now, by the same word are kept in store to receive a fire unto fire against the day of judgment and the perdition of, of ungodly men. Remember what we just read in, in um Second Thessalonians chapter one, verse six to ten. It said that the, he's gonna take vengeance on them that trouble you. He is going to bring wrath or destruction on the wicked when he comes to receive his saints. It says here fire against the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men the destruction of ungodly men but beloved be not ignorant of this one thing that one day unto the master is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day the master is not slack right i'm not going to talk about all these side statements um i could answer that on a q a but it says the master is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness but as he is long suffering so all this time before the second coming is being given not because of slackness of his promise, but because of long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So he's offering us time before his coming to escape the wrath of the land, to escape the wrath of Yah and to receive the reward. But let's check this out. The day of the master will come as a thief in the night. Now look at the description here. In the, the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. We saw in Revelation 6.16, it says that the scroll, the, the, the sky will roll back like a scroll <laughs> when he comes. It says the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat and the earth also and the works or the works of ungodly men that are in it shall be burned up this is not talking about the the second death this is talking about the coming of the the master it says seeing thing that those things shall be dissolved what manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and in godliness looking for and hastening the coming of the day of elohim wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat Nevertheless, according to his promise, we look for a new heavens and a new earth where the righteousness dwells. So look at this description. I need, I need us to ask this question. There's a changing of the righteous into immortality in a moment, right? In a twinkling of an eye, according to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 49 to 53. They need to come because the, they need to be changed because the sun is coming. In a, in a certain type of magnitude of majesty in which he, everything will be destroyed. He is not only coming in a destructive way because of his nature. He's purposely coming because he needs to take vengeance on the wicked. Now, I want to ask the question. With the elements on fire, with the righteous turned into immortals, with the wrath being taken on those who are persecuting and bringing trouble onto you. What nation is going to be able to survive? What wicked people will be able to survive the coming of Messiah? Is the Messiah going to come in such a magnitude and then just sit down in Jerusalem somewhere and all the nations are going to come to him? What just occurred? to the earth when he comes what is he what type of vengeance is he taking out on those who did not believe right we have to understand his nature is coming this way because everything that was supposed to happen everything that was supposed to give an opportunity was given prior to his second coming when he comes there is no other chance. There is no other opportunity to fix things. There is no other opportunity for the nations to come and enjoy whatever it is. None of that is going to happen because they can't withstand. The wicked cannot withstand the glory of Messiah when he comes. Let's continue to look at this. 
Let's continue to look at this. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. Then we're going to go to the book of Isaiah, see what the prophet Isaiah says about standing in the presence of such glory. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 talks about the son of perdition. Look what it says. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our master, Yahushua, and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by the letter from us, as that day of Messiah is at hand. Right? He's talking about the second coming. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there be a falling away first. And that man of sin or lawlessness be revealed the son of perdition or destruction. He is going to be revealed. He is revealed already. We're going to talk about that in another in another study uh, specifically. It says that that this individual, this lawless one, opposes and exalts himself above all that is called Elohim or that is worship, so that he as Elohim sits in a temple of Elohim, showing himself that he is Elohim. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know that withhold that that what withhold that he might be revealed in his time. Okay. Let's go down. It says, because the mystery of iniquity is already working. So during the power of Rome, this wicked power was already beginning to be seen. This is only he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way. Then shall that wicked be revealed whom the master. Now watch this. Look at the nature of, of masters coming. The master shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. The brightness of his coming. Very important. The wicked will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. He will be taking vengeance. The wrath of the lamb is at the second coming. Who is going to be able to stand during the event, these events, while the earth is on fire, the elements is on fire, to the point where Peter is comforting his his hearers by saying, we're already promised a new heaven and new earth. So even though the elements and the earth is burned up and dissolved, we don't need to worry about it because there's a new heaven and new earth, which Revelation tells us about. Um, and well, all the prophets tell us about that. Let's look at Isaiah. Look at the book of Isaiah. We're going to go to verse uh, chapter 33. We're going to look at verse 10 to 17. Listen to this description. Now will I rise, saith Yahuwah. Now will I be exalted. Now will I lift up myself. You shall conceive chaff. You shall bring forth stubble and your breath as fire shall devour you. The people shall be as the burnings of lime and the thorns cut up shall be shall they be burned in the fire many people think that this is a description of the lake of fire no this is the second coming watch hear ye after that far that are far off what what i have done and you that are near acknowledge my might the sinners in zion are afraid fearfulness have surprised the hypocrites who among us who among us shall dwell in the devouring fire who among us shall dwell in everlasting burnings? What is this talking about? Is it talking about who's going to be able to live or dwell in the everlasting fire or the lake of fire? No. Who among us shall be shall dwell in the with the devouring fire? With the devouring fire. It says that the Father is like a devouring fire, right? His presence, his majesty. So who is going to be able to dwell in that presence? Who among us shall dwell in the everlasting burnings? Look, look who is talking about. He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly. He that despises the gain of oppressions that shakes his hands from holding the bribes, stops his ears from hearing of blood and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. 
he shall dwell on high. His place of defense, sorry, his place of defense shall be the munition of rocks. Bread shall be given to him. His water shall be sure. You see who's going to be able to, to be able to withstand and, and dwell, live in his physical presence. Why would the why would humans be able to live in this physical presence? It is because there is a change that occurs. There's a change that happens. We will be changed in the twinkling of an eye in order to see him, as we read in First John chapter three verse two. It says we don't know what it means to what what it will be, but we know that we will be like him when he comes. When he appears, we shall be like him because we shall be able to dwell in his presence. It says, your eyes, the righteous, shall see the king in his beauty, in his majesty. And they shall behold the land from that is very far off. Very clear. Very clear. What's going to happen to the wicked? They're going to be running away. What's going to happen with the wicked? Yah is going to take vengeance. Messiah is going to take vengeance on the wicked. And what's going to happen at his coming? The earth will be affected by this by his devouring fire presence. Uh, let's look at the book of uh, prophet Malachi. Right. Let's look at the prophet Malachi in chapter four. One to three, it says, behold, the day comes that shall burn as an oven. All the proud, yea, all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that comes shall burn them up, say, if you of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch, but unto you, Right unto the righteous that fear my name, shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow as calves in the stall. You see the difference to the wicked, there's going to be a burning up, a destruction, but then to the righteous, there's going to be a healing, there's going to be a healing, immortality, life is going to be given to the righteous. This is not the lake of fire. This is the second coming. What's going to be given to the unrighteous and what's going to be given to the righteous? He says, I'm coming to reward every man according to their works. The, the, the wrath of the father has poured out in the seven in the seven last plagues. And the wrath of the lamb is given to them at the destruction at his second coming. Verse three, it says, and they shall tread down the wicked because they shall be ashes under the feet under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith Yahuwah of hosts. So look at look at what's going to happen that day. Are we really going to say there's going to be a whole bunch of non-believing nations that is going to have another opportunity to, to learn about who Yah is? Well, let's see what Messiah says about the nations being oblivious or ignorant to the truth. Verse 14 of Matthew chapter 24 says, this is the kingdom, this is the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, then shall the end come. They are going to be preached to the word right before the second coming, the word, the truth is going to go out to all the nations as a witness against all the world. So when this judgment comes, there is not going to be like this time to now give the 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 good news. No, there's not going to be uh, this time to give this truth. Let's go to the book of Nahum. Nahum. Let's see. Nahum chapter one. We're going to look at the book of Nahum chapter one, looking at verse five and six. It says the mountains quake at him right talking about his presence and the hills melt the hills melt the earth is burned at his presence the world and all that dwell therein not just mountains and the floor is going to be burnt everything that dwells therein every person every wicked person that dwells therein will be burned at his presence except for the righteous. They are able to stand in these everlasting burnings. Verse six says, who can stand before his indignation? Who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. Who? We already saw the prophet Isaiah answered this in Isaiah chapter 33, verse 10 to 17. 
16 and 17 specifically answers who is able to stand at this time of destruction when the Messiah comes. Let's go to Zephaniah. Zephaniah chapter 1, looking at verse 18. It says, neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of Yah's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy because he shall make even a speedy riddance of them all that dwell in the land. These people are going to be, they're going to get rid of them. It's this destruction is going to be removing the wicked, not, not giving everybody another chance. Let's go to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms, chapter 21. We're going to look at verse 9 and 10. It says, you shall make them as a fiery oven in the time of your anger. Yahuwah shall swallow them up in his wrath and fire shall devour them. Their fruit shall, shall you destroy from the earth and their seed from among the children of men. Destruction is going to occur when the lamb comes. No one will survive the presence of the lamb except for the righteous who will receive their reward of immortality, they will be the only ones who will be able to survive this type of destruction at the coming of Messiah. Messiah is not coming to sit down in no wilderness. He's not coming to take Israel out to some wilderness. The wilderness will be burned up too, because the whole earth is going to feel the effects of this glory, of this majesty. He's not coming down to sit on some throne in some country where wicked nations are going to come and make a decision at that time. There is no decision making at that time. So the question comes up, what is, why does it say that all the nations will flow through it? See, many people don't understand that Yah is going to set up his people now before this destruction comes by his coming. He is going to set up his people now. We clearly see in Revelation chapter seven that before the 144,000 are sealed, he tells the four angels to hold back this destruction. Hold on until I seal the 144. When he seals his people in their mind, they will be spreading this truth around the world as a witness against all nations. This is going to occur prior to the second coming. And we see that with the same language of the whole the nations flowing through Mount Zion, we see this in Isaiah chapter 2. Let's look at it. Isaiah chapter 2. So we can clearly see the representation here. Isaiah chapter 2, looking at verse 1 to 5. It says, In the word of Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the last days, right? So it's taken us to a place and time. So we can need we need to apply it in that place and time. Last days is always before Messiah come. When Messiah come, immortality is given, and then there is no last days. <laughs> there is no last days for the for the righteous. But last the last days is our time on this earth before immortality is given to the righteous. It says, It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the of Yahuwah's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations, right? shall flow into it now they're thinking that this is going to occur with this flowery you know is israel is given back to the people and all these things and hooray we're back in the land and all the nations will come to that particular place no look at what it says many people shall go and say come let us go up to the mountain of yahuwah to the house of elohim of jacob and he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths for out of Zion. He's going to, he's about to explain to you real quick. He's about to explain to you what it means by Yahuwah will teach the nations and will teach them how to walk in his paths. It says out of Zion. Now, who is Zion? Who is Zion? Many people apply this to a location. It is not talking about a location. It is talking about a people. The mountain of Yahuwah, the house of Elohim, of Jacob. It's not talking about a place. It is talking about a people. You understand? Think about this. Jerusalem is not called the mountain of Yahuwah. The people is. Jer 
it, Canaan is not called the house of Elohim of Jacob. The people is. So out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of Yahuwah from Jerusalem. Why does it say Jerusalem, right? Everybody is going to talk about that. Why does it say Jerusalem? We're going to talk about that in a second. So it says the people, out of the people, the law is going to come. The word of Yah is going to come out of the people to all the nations. This is what Messiah said in Matthew 24. It says, he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people and they that shall beat their swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. This is not talking about those who reject those who reject the word of Yah. This is only talking about those of the nations who accept the word of Yah. O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of Yahuwah. When you accept the truth, this is how your nature will be. You will no longer war as the world wars. You will beat your swords into plowshares and your spears into pruning hooks. This is what happened now. I, I hope that this is what happens to us. The, the mindset of the world, doing things the way the world does, fighting the way the world does, is no longer in a person who now accepts the law of Yah, the word of Yah. So why does it say the word of Yah is, is going to come from Jerusalem if it's not from the actual Jerusalem? Well, I think that this is very easy to answer. Many places in scripture, location was used as the uh, an expression of the people, right? Uh, let's see if um, let's see if I can find a few a few verses. Let's see if we can find a few verses that um kind of kind of reveal that. All right. All right. I'm trying to see. I'm pretty sure you guys could find verses showing how the terminology of the word Jerusalem is referring to the people and not just the place. Let me see if I can find it. All right. So I found a couple of verses. So Matthew 3. Is it 5? Right. So Matthew 3, 4, and 5. It says, The same John had a raiment of a camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his food was locust and wild honey. It says, Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan. So it's saying that, in, in just plain words, it's saying that Jerusalem went to John the Baptist. All Judea went to John the Baptist. All the places around the Jordan went to John the Baptist. We know that it's not talking specifically about uh, locations, that it's talking about people. It's talking about the people of Jerusalem, but it referred to them as Jerusalem. In Luke 6, 17, it says, And he came down with them and stood in a plain, and the company of his disciples, and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem, and from the Sea of Coast of Tyre and Sidon. So it's talking about, whenever it talks about the, the place Jerusalem came out, it's talking about the people. So when it says that the law comes out of Zion, and the word of Yah out of Jerusalem, it's talking about it's coming out of us. It's coming out of the people. We are delivering this word to the four corners of the earth as a testimony against all nations, all nations. So 
what does that tell us? How can the wicked nation survive at the coming of Messiah if the coming of Messiah is in the way that it describes? If he is going to bring uh, destruction to those who have not believed and rejected and brought trouble to the, those who have believed, secondly, is he going? his presence is going to destroy the wicked as well as nature itself, the elements and the earth and the sky will be on fire. How can there be any nations that exist at his coming? They are not. They all will perish and they all will wait until the second resurrection. But all the righteous will be changed and all the righteous shall raise so they can be with the Messiah, go into the city that he prepared and dwell there with the Messiah until after the thousand years. Let's look at that verse real quick. And we're going to talk about this thousand years, Revelation, Revelation chapter 20, I believe. It says here in verse five, the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the he that part that has part in the first resurrection on such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of Elohim and of Messiah and shall reign with them for a thousand years. This is the millennial, supposed it was the millennial reign. This occurs when the Messiah comes back, raises his people, gives the reward, takes repay, uh, punishment on the wicked, the wrath of the lamb, the destruction at his presence to everything that exists. He's going to take his people to the city for that thousand years. He's going to be with his people for a thousand years and no one else will be alive until after the thousand years. This is what's going to happen. The millennial reign is in the city that Yah has prepared himself with his own hands it has nothing to do with this earth because this earth will be destroyed at the, at the wrath of the land. Okay. So we need not to be projecting this idea that there's going to be a whole thousand years of time that people have an opportunity to change, to repent, to accept the truth. This is a deception. This is a deception. Now is the time. Now is the time. We need to accept this truth now because his word will go out as a test of, as a testimony against, as a witness against all nations before his coming. When that, that witness goes out, and he comes, everything that happens is already judged. He is doing that judgment right this moment, right this second. As people teach the truth and reject the truth, as people twist the truth and change the truth, as people accept the truth and receive the truth, there's a judgment happening right now in which would allow Messiah, when he comes, to rightly be justified in giving you a reward once he comes. There has to be a whole judgment that occurs. How is he going to give you a reward if he has not determined that you are righteous, that you are deserving of it? He's going to come and give you the reward of immortality when he comes. That's because right now he's determining whether you are rightfully uh, deserving or worthy of it. So we need to surrender and submit ourselves right now before his second coming. We need to be working with him and be sealed with, when, when it's time to be sealed. And we need to be delivering the truth as a witness to all nations right now. So I hope that you understand the nature of the second coming. We're going to be talking a little bit about the, the millennium going into the second death to learn about the sequence of all the nations being raised, all the nations surrounding the city, which is what's talked about in Zechariah as well. So I hope that this was clear and simple enough uh, but if you have any questions please, please feel free to send those questions over and we'll love to dissect and respond to those questions and give you the answers that you guys need so praise Yah and uh, may Yah bless you guys Shalom 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 thank you guys for joining our study today I hope that it was edifying and if you want to support this ministry you can support us on 4ALC.com and don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube page click the like button and the notification bell I hope to see you guys on the next study Shalom guys